Today we're going to be talking about the process of transcription. First we want to review the central dogma which states that DNA is transcribed into RNA, RNA is translated into protein, and it's protein that creates traits or characteristics in organisms. So when we talk about transcription we're talking about the first part of the dogma, the process where DNA is used to create RNA. And when we speak about transcription leading to translation, that RNA is specifically mRNA or messenger RNA. So in this process, DNA is our template and RNA is going to be formed from that template strand by pairing up complementary bases. Remember, when we talk about RNA, ribonucleic acid, our four bases are just a little bit different. We don't see any thymine in RNA. Instead, the molecule called uracil substitutes. So as we talk through this process, we're going to be using a prokaryotic model. In other words, we're going to talk specifically about transcription in bacteria. And then towards the end of the topic, we'll talk a little bit about eukaryotic transcription particularly in how it compares to prokaryotic. So now we're going to talk about the specific process where DNA is transcribed to make messenger RNA. Remember we said that whenever we discuss transcription, we're talking about only a portion of the DNA molecule being unwound and transcribed. So within the chromosome, DNA is only going to be unwound in the area of the genes that the organism has a need for at that moment. In other words, the organism is going to have ongoing needs for different proteins at different times in its life cycle. Only those genes which help create those proteins are going to be transcribed. The strands have to be separated though, specifically in that area. We'll discuss how, how that happens. Now, once the template DNA is exposed, complementary bases from RNA must be matched to the template DNA. And bonds have to be formed between those complementary bases within that new mRNA molecule. Remember we talked about how processes like these, where we're building new bonds in biological systems, often require the presence of an enzyme. And that's because these are non-spontaneous processes, energetically speaking. So this enzyme will do a couple of things for us to allow this process to occur in a living cell. First of all, it's going to help bring the substrates together. And second of all, it's going to help lower the activation energy of the reaction. In other words, the energy that's required to help not only break down existing bonds, but build new bonds. This is a slide that we've seen before when we talked about the general overview of RNA as a molecule. And I want you to look first at the top of this slide where you can see a red DNA molecule in the double helix form that's been opened in a region. And that's what you're looking at right here. So we've got two single strands of DNA exposed now. And on the lower strand, we're starting to build a complementary molecule of RNA. The enzyme that's going to help us build the RNA molecule is called RNA polymerase. Now when you look at that term polymerase you can see the word polymer in it and then an ASE at the end. Anytime you see this ASE at the end you can assume that this is an enzyme. So this, the job of this enzyme is to build a polymer. It's a polymer ase, or an enzyme that makes an RNA polymer. And this is an enzyme that's going to catalyze the formation of the complementary strand of RNA from the DNA template. This is an enzyme that's going to help build a bond between the growing strand of RNA and the incoming RNA monomers called ribonucleotides. This is an enzyme that always works in one direction and that direction is the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. In other words, 
this enzyme is only going to be able to add new monomers, new ribonucleotides, onto the three prime end of the growing molecule. And at this three prime end, we're going to be able to see an exposed hydroxy group. It's that hydroxy group that will be the site of a new bond being formed. In the end, as the enzyme works along the DNA template, it will eventually produce a complete molecule of mRNA that's complementary to the DNA template. Now it's important to notice that only one strand of DNA will serve as our template molecule. Only one strand of the DNA will serve as the template for the formation of this new RNA molecule. The other strand of DNA is what's known as the non-template strand or the coding strand. This is the strand of DNA that's complementary to the template strand. So if we go back to our image, again in the area where our double helix has been opened up to expose the genes that need to be transcribed and translated to produce proteins at this moment for the cell, we can see that this bottom strand is the strand that's serving as our template. The RNA, in other words, is being produced in a complementary manner to that template strand. The other strand is not being used. This is the non-template strand or the coding strand that's there to match the template strand in a complementary manner and help build the double helix. So let's take a look at an imaginary strand of DNA shown here in black that serves as our template strand. So this is a molecule of DNA that is in the primary structure. In other words, what we can see is the sequence or the order of the bases in this molecule. We don't see the sugar phosphate backbone. We only see the bases. And in fact, we only see the abbreviation for the bases. A or T or G or C. So when we read a molecule of DNA, we start at the five prime end, and here you can see in this case we've got an A, followed by a T, followed by a C, a G, a G, a T, and so on. Again, there's a sugar phosphate backbone along this molecule. We just don't draw it in. Instead, we simply draw in an abbreviation of the bases that are exposed. Now, if we look up at the coding DNA, this is a strand that's complementary to the template DNA. This would also be known as the non-template strand. You'll notice that it's oriented in the other direction. The five prime end is down here, the three prime end is up here. And each of the bases in the non-template strand is going to be complementary to the template strand base. So where there's an A in the template strand, the complementary base is a T. Where there's a T in the template, the complementary is an A. Where there's a C, it's a G. And where there's a G, we'll see a C. And that will continue all the way down both strands. Now take a look at the strand at the bottom. This purple colored sequence of bases represents an mRNA molecule. You'll notice that it's oriented in the same direction as the template, and you'll also notice that it's complementary to the template. The only difference is we have U's in the mRNA instead of T's. There are no T's. There is no thymine in RNA. So everywhere that there's an A in the template strand, we're going to have a U in the RNA. Where there's a T, we'll have an A. Where there's a C, we'll have a G and where there's a G will have a C. So that will continue all the way down the strand of RNA. Now the RNA polymerase enzyme is helping to build this molecule of mRNA and it's helping to catalyze the formation of a bond between each one of these bases. The polymerase enzyme is building covalent bonds between each one of these bases. It's hydrogen bonding that will connect the RNA to the DNA strand. Now, it gets a little complex when we start talking about how the enzyme works with each of the incoming monomers. 
the RNA polymerase enzyme is going to add these incoming bases, these complementary bases, only when the bases are in a specific form. That specific form is called an activated monomer form, or what we call an NTP. If we're talking about bases that are coming in to build RNA, we call them NTPs. And if we're talking about bases coming in to build DNA, we would call them DNTPs. The NTP shorthand stands for nucleoside triphosphate, and that's the molecule that you're seeing in this shaded box up here. Nucleoside triphosphate. This looks an awful lot like an RNA, pro uh, an RNA monomer or a ribonucleotide. We have a sugar, and we have a base, and we have a phosphate, but we also have additional phosphate molecules. That's why we call this a triphosphate. There are actually three phosphate groups attached to this molecule. So this is the activated form of the monomer molecule. And what happens is that the ordinary monomer molecule is given these extra phosphate groups through the donation of phosphates from a molecule of ATP. We talked a little bit about this ATP mo molecule in class. This is the currency of energy in a cell. ATP is a molecule that has three phosphate groups on it. When one comes off, it becomes ADP. When two come off, it becomes AMP. That's adenosine triphosphate, ATP, adenosine diphosphate, that's ADP, and adenosine monophosphate, that's AMP. So our ATP molecule is going to be used um, to help donate these phosphate groups to our ribonucleotide monomer. Once we have the two extra phosphates attached, this molecule is charged, it's activated, and it's ready to be added on to the growing chain of mRNA. And that's what you're seeing over here on this side of the screen. We've got sugar phosphate base, we've got sugar phosphate base, and you'll notice that there's a bond in between them. This is the incoming monomer, and we want to add it on to this short chain of two um, monomers. So what, what I want you to do is follow the arrow down, and you'll see that the process of adding this monomer onto this short chain of RNA produces a second bond, produces a bond between the incoming molecule and the existing RNA, and in the process, the release of two phosphates. It's the breaking of the bond between this first phosphate and these second two phosphates that produces the energy that's needed for the enzyme to build this bond, this new covalent bond between the existing strand of RNA and the incoming monomer molecule. This is a non-spontaneous reaction. We've got to have an enzyme, and we've got to have some energy to make it occur. Now, the bond that forms between the incoming monomers of RNA is a covalent bond, but it gets a special name because it's a type of covalent bond that's only found in nucleic acid. The name of this covalent bond is a phosphodiester bond. So the RNA polymerase is catalyzing the formation of a covalent bond called a phosphodiester bond. And this bond is going to um, be built between the 3' prime hydroxyl group that's exposed on the 3' prime end of the growing chain of RNA and that first phosphate group from the activated NTP that's coming in that's being added on in the next position. So just as we saw that covalent bonds between amino acids in proteins have a special name called a peptide bond, so the covalent bonds in nucleic acids also have a special name called a phosphodiester bond. 
And in this slide here, we can see in a little more detail how the phosphodiester bond is built. So what we're looking at here in this box is a template molecule of DNA. All we can see are the bases coming off. So this represents our sugar phosphate backbone on the DNA template strand. And these are two bases that are jutting off. Now it doesn't say A or T or G or C, it's just a colored base, yellow and orange. So for the purposes of the slide, we're going to imagine that purple in the RNA molecule is complementary to yellow in the DNA, and green in the RNA is complementary to orange on the DNA. So we have one monomer coming in and one monomer that's already bound. And what they're showing us is that this incoming monomer has three phosphate groups on it. It's an activated monomer. It's an NTP. So we have a phosphate group here and here and here. This phosphate group is going to provide, uh, these extra phosphate groups are going to provide the energy that's necessary in order to catalyze the formation of a bond between this molecule and this molecule. What we're looking at in the second half of the slide over here is the aftermath of that reaction. We're going to cleave off or cut off two phosphates and we're going to build a bond between that first phosphate and the hydroxyl group, the OH group, that was exposed on the end of the RNA molecule. This is the bond here and this is our phosphodiester bond. In this slide we can see an image of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is an enzyme and all enzymes are proteins. So as we've discussed in class, all proteins assume a mature folded shape and that shape is directly related to their function. We talked a little bit about how if you change the order of the amino acids in a protein, you can change its structure. You can change how the functional side groups interact with each other and how the final tertiary shape of the molecule can change. Remember, structure of a protein directly relates to its function. And the structure of this enzyme directly relates to its job of helping to build phosphodiester bonds in a molecule of RNA. Notice that you can see red alpha helices in here, blue beta sheets, yellow loops of amino acids. This is a tertiary or mature shape of this particular protein called RNA polymerase. So we're going to talk about the details of transcription or how this occurs actually within the organism using bacteria as our model. And in order to do that, we first need to understand that our RNA polymerase enzyme is actually composed of two subunits. Those subunits are called sigma and core. The sigma portion of RNA polymerase is actually the regulatory portion of the molecule, and the core is the catalytic part of the molecule the molecule that actually does the active work of building a phosphodiester bond. The RNA polymerase, like all enzymes, also contains an active site where the action occurs, if you will. And this active site actually contains multiple channels. Now what I mean by that is, if we took that three-dimensional molecule, that RNA polymerase enzyme, and we took it and we used a knife to cut through that molecule and split it open. On the inside of our three-dimensional globular protein, we would find some hollow areas, some, some tunnels, if you will, or channels through that protein. The active site of an enzyme, of this enzyme in particular, contains multiple channels, and we'll talk about the purpose of those channels in a minute. So the first thing that happens in, when transcription um, occurs in bacteria is that the sigma 
part of this molecule is going to bind to the core part of this molecule. That's going to allow the sigma and the core to create the intact RNA polymerase and start this process of transcription. Now we're going to see that transcription in bacteria has three distinct phases, three different steps, if you will, that we can describe in order. And those are called the initiation phase, the elongation phase, and the termination phase. And we're going to talk about each one of these. So for this uh, portion of the lecture, we'll stop with this slide. I want, I want you to take a look at a couple of things in this slide. Up at the top, you can see a red double helix, which represents the DNA that needs to be transcribed at this moment to help produce proteins that the cell has a need for. This uh, blue and green molecule that's interacting with the DNA is our RNA polymerase enzyme. I want you to notice that it's a large molecule. We've talked about how proteins are particularly large molecules. And you can really see that in this slide in relation to the molecule of DNA. The area that's shaded in blue represents the sigma subunit, and that's the part of the enzyme that's regulatory. It's going to have a regulatory function. The green part of the um, model represents the core of the enzyme, and that's the part of the enzyme that's going to do work for us. So stay tuned for the next part of the video where we'll talk about these three specific steps of transcription in bacteria, initiation, elongation, and termination.